Wouldn't it be something if God raised up a whole new army of people in America who prayed without ceasing? Welcome to the One Cry Podcast, a nationwide call for spiritual awakening. And now, your hosts, Bill Eliff and Kyle Reno. Well, welcome to the One Cry Podcast. I'm Kyle Reno. This is Bill Eliff. We have the privilege of being your host, and we can't believe you keep coming back every week, and we're glad that you do. And we hope you're sharing it with other people because, man, our, mm-hmm. our heart in this and the whole heartbeat behind One Cry mm-hmm. is to see God start something in you mm-hmm. and start something in churches, and it spreads to cities until we see a real move of God. In the nations. That's yeah. right. And, you know, that's that's going to take all kinds of prayer. <laughs> like all and of and that's why we're spending this, this, this series and talking about, you know, people have such a narrow view of prayer. Yeah. And sometimes you think, well, it's just this one thing. Right. No, it's it's how it's it's walking and talking with God, right? And it's doing it all day long, right? Right. And so there's all kinds of conversation. Yeah, I think we want a nice little neat box for prayer. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I know I'm like that in life. You know, mm-hmm. I want to I want to control it. Here it is. Mm-hmm. Like I, I I totally get it. And making it a little compartment that doesn't interrupt all the other things in my life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That I can get it done and move on. But I think what the Lord went to great lengths to do is to say, now let me show you all kinds of aspects to prayer and what it is. And I, I know even today, and something God's really spoke to your heart, and that prayers was intended to be all the time. Unceasing. Wow. You know, uh, Kyle, there's uh, this three little words in the Bible messed me up longer than and mm-hmm. and in more ways than any other three words in first Thessalonians five seventeen. Pray okay without ceasing. Oh. <laughs> ruh, ruh, yeah. Oh, ruh, ruh. yeah. And I and I saw that in college. I remember very distinctly in college seeing that and thought, oh my goodness. Well I'll figure out how to do that. Well then years mm. and I realized I'm not doing that. Mm. And I realized, though, that God uh, can't tell us he's a just God and a fair God. He can't ask us to do something we can't do. Right. We may not want to. We may not know how. Right. But by his grace, we can do any command that he gives mm-hmm. us. And this is a command, pray without ceasing. I think part of this is understanding that this is not about a compartmentalized activity Mm. that says, well, I prayed, you know, at at six o'clock this morning, and now I'm going to go do the rest of my life. Prayer is walking with God. It's, I'm the vine, Jesus said, you're the branch, abide in me. Mm. And and if you do, you're going to bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So all day long, we should be carrying on this running conversation uh, with God. There's so many great illustrations of that in the scripture, but one that really impresses me is Nehemiah. You know, we look at the book of Nehemiah and, and it can be, it can be studied from so many angles, you know, about vision, about leadership, but about revival. One of the greatest revivals in history happened. Whole nation came back to God. Uh, but Really, one of the most foundational things about Nehemiah, he was just a man of unceasing prayer. And I want to illustrate that to you this morning uh, because uh, 12 times in in these chapters, we find Nehemiah praying. And we find, find him praying at every single moment of his journey. And and I don't I don't think we you know we think about Daniel who went up during the time of prayer, and there are times of prayer. Peter and John, Acts chapter three, went up at the time of prayer to the temple. So there are set times of prayer that are really critical and really important. But but we ought to have just bullet prayers all day long, and this just running conversation. With God, so just just to lay a biblical foundation in your soul about this, let me just let me just highlight this to you. Are you ready? Here we go. Here it's a it's a speed read through Nehemiah. Number one, Nehemiah prayed when he was burdened. Chapter one, verse four. When I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and I mourned 
for days, and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. When he got burdened, what did he do? Come up with a plan or uh, go talk to people or get on the evening news? No, he sat down, he wept, he fasted, he prayed. And by the way, he prayed for months and months like this before he approached uh, the king. He prayed when he was burdened. Are you doing that? Secondly, he prayed when the sins of the people were overwhelming. He comes in chapter 1, verse 7, We have acted very corruptly against you. We have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the ordinances. And, uh, and Lord, uh, I have sinned against you. We've sinned. I've sinned. So he prayed when he saw corruption. When he saw need, he just immediately prayed. And then number three, he prayed when he had an overwhelming task to do. He comes at the end of chapter one and he said, Oh Lord, I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant uh, and make your servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. He's talking about the king. And he was, he was going to go in and approach the king about going back to Jerusalem and, and rebuilding the temple. So when he had a big task, he didn't say, man, I got I to gotta come up with this extraordinary plan. I got to do this. I got to do this. No, he prayed. I'm going in before this king. Lord, uh, help me. Lord, give me favor before this king. Do you do that? When you're walking into a meeting, do you walk in praying? When you're in the middle of a conversation and you realize that something needs to be done and you're the one that needs to do it, do you pray? Do you cry out to the Lord? And then look at number four. He prayed in the middle of a hard conversation. So here's Nehemiah, and uh, he's talking to the king. And the king said to me, what would you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. I just love this. Here's the king. I mean, this is the this is the most powerful man in that day on the face of the earth. And he's standing before him, and this guy could could have him killed in an instant. And he said, Well, what do you what do you want, Nehemiah? And Nehemiah said, Well, I want this and this and this. No. Nehemiah's standing there, and I can just imagine him looking at the king and praying at the same time. I prayed to the God of heaven. And 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 then that way. What happened? Suddenly he is, he is attached to heaven, and this God-initiated praying that we've talked about uh, came through him with God-initiated ideas and thoughts that were the answer to his prayer. We ought to be doing that all the time. I can't tell you how many hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times, I've been in a conversation with somebody, and I've realized I, I don't know what to do right here. And as I'm talking to them, I'm praying, Lord, please speak. Give me words to say. Lord, would you just lift their hearts? I had a dear friend, one of the founding elders of, of our church in Little Rock, the Summit Church, Don Dudgeon. And uh, Don was a great man of God. And you'd be talking to him about anything in the world. And if he was moved to pray, he'd just start praying. Eyes open. You'd be talking, and uh, he'd say, Lord, would you help Bill in this? And would you provide this? And first time he did that, it just freaked me out. I, kind of, I looked around, I thought, oh, my goodness, who's he talking to? What are we doing here? And uh, But then I realized the beauty of that, that Don was always in a three-way conversation that kept rolling all day long. It wasn't just you and me. It was, it was, it was him and me and God. And Don was as natural talking to God in that conversation as he was talking to me. That's unceasing prayer. And look at this. Nehemiah prayed uh, when he had a physical, financial need that was impossible. I mean, here he is. He's a servant. He's a slave, really. And he's going back to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And he didn't have any money or resources. And so what did he do? Nehemiah 2, 4. So I prayed to the God of heaven. And guess what happened? The king granted everything he needed because the good hand of God was upon me. Is that what you do when you get in a financial bind? Or when you face a task, a, 
that you need resources to get something done for the king, uh, do you pray? That's what Nehemiah did because he lived with unceasing prayer. And he prayed when, here's number number uh, six, when he had opposition to the work and visible enemies. You know the story, they start building the wall and all of a sudden uh, these enemies come up and they don't want that wall to be built. Uh, and by the way, those enemies are still there. They don't want Christ's wall to be built. They don't want Christ's kingdom to advance. They don't want the church to reach lost people for Christ. So they're constantly going to be opposing you. And these guys sounded real good. Hey, let's come down to the plain of Ono and and have a little talk about this, or let's go to the sanctuary and and discuss this. And uh, but Nehemiah prayed, "Hear, O God, how we are despised! Return their reproach on their own heads. Give them up for plunder in the land of captivity." Nehemiah four four. He prayed when he had an enemy. And number eight, he prayed when he was being falsely accused by his enemies and was weak and discouraged. What did he do, just give up? No, he prayed. All of them were trying to frighten us, it says in Nehemiah 6, 9, uh, they, saying they will become discouraged. But now, O oh God, strengthen our hands. So, so when you get in the middle of your day and your kids are just overwhelming you or your job is just beating you down, you get so frightened or discouraged or you just want to throw in the towel. Do like Susanna Wesley did. You know, she had all these kids and they said in the middle of the day, often she would just take her apron and throw it over her head. And the kids knew that when the apron was on her head, mama was praying. <laughs> and uh, so just, just, just all through the day at moments of discouragement, you know, I've, I've had some physical challenges uh, in my life the last few years, and I lose energy. I lose strength. And I just find myself in the middle of something. I'm, I'm in a task that I need to keep going, just saying, Lord, I don't, I don't have any strength. You are my strength. You live inside of me. Lord, give me strength. He's very faithful to do that because guess what? He gets the glory when that happens. We could go on and on. Let me just mention he prayed when he was frightened by his enemies, Nehemiah 7. He prayed when God had accomplished the work uh, and they came to consecrate themselves and make a fresh covenant with God. Uh, he prayed when he found the people slipping back again, backsliding, Nehemiah 13. And he prayed when he had to confront the people for their backsliding, Nehemiah 13, 29. Wouldn't it be something if a whole army of people, and I'm convinced there are many people like this. My wife is a person like this. She prays all day long, just all day long about things. Uh, but wouldn't it be something if God raised up a whole new army of people in America who prayed without ceasing, that were just constantly in communication with God? Guess what? The person who prays brings God into the equation. So instead of just five minutes on the run in the morning on the way to work, you're praying all day long about everything. And I think this is the kind of praying, uh, Kyle, that accomplishes much. Well, welcome, uh, One Cry family and especially the One Cry podcast family, what a joy it is for me to personally, once again, as the founder of the One Cry movement, Byron Paulus here, to uh, be a part of what we are so, so, so thrilled about today. And Matt Bennett is the CEO, president he was at least, and has grown enormously over the last years of Christian Union, which is the, I believe, most prominent campus ministry uh, on the Ivy League campuses and beyond at other high academic elite schools. And uh, what I love about Matt is that he has a passion for revival and spiritual awakening. And you'll hear perhaps on our next podcast what that looks like. And then also uh, because he just is a man of prayer and a ministry that is built from where I sit, Matt, your ministry has been built literally on the foundation of prayer. And I hope you would shake your head yes, and I'm not deceiving the people. And uh, with that, uh, 
I would love for our folks to hear how did you come to a place where you decided prayer isn't just an add-on. Prayer for revival is not just something that we're supposed to do in ministry life, but prayer is the foundation. It's the core. So can we begin there today, Matt, and take us back to where God began to lead you in building a campus ministry on genuine, authentic prayer? Yeah, thanks, Byron. So good to see you. Thanks for having me on the podcast. It's an honor to be on, to see you as well. I admire you so much in your work with uh, One Cry as well as Life Action. And and prayer is so important. Uh, In Acts 6, uh, when they are... Uh, dividing up the work and having the deacons take care of the important work of feeding the widows, they say that the ministry of the apostles is prayer and ministry of the word. And prayer is listed first. It's prayer and ministry of the word, not the other way around. Both are important. And so it's an important ministry that we have if we want to be used to the Lord and to see things happen in his name. And what can happen sometimes is we maybe neglect it or our faith level is low or maybe we need more training in prayer, or we don't have people to pray with, or something like that, and and then it gets neglected. But it makes an enormous difference in the spiritual realm, and then therefore in the physical realm. If we want to see people uh, make decisions for Christ, for people to persist in holiness, then we need a robust prayer. And we need a prayer life consistent with what the Lord expects of us from the scriptures. When you say we need a prayer life, consistent with scripture. I doubt um, most of our listening audience today are on the same page what that looks like as you have been and are. So at some point here in this podcast, uh, they uh, I look forward to them hearing the tangibles because you elevated the need for and what prayer should look like um, in my heart, but in this ministry called Life Action Ministries in One Christ. So anyway, you can go on. I just had to not let us get past that. <laughs> no, that's fine. Yeah, it's uh, we, you can do research into the practices of the first century church and for the first many centuries of the church. And what's amazing is it's a, it's a little subtle unless you know the historical background, but the pattern of the Christians from the very beginning was to join into with the Jewish patterns, and that is to go to the temple to pray at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m., about an hour each time. And so that's why you see in Acts chapter 3, it says they were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, 3 p.m., and they saw the miracle of the cripple who was healed. That's what everybody did. And even if you're outside Jerusalem where the temple was in, say, Caesarea and other places where you had people like Cornelius, he would pray at those same times as well. So it was in addition to free range prayer whenever you want. There were set times of prayer. And we know without a doubt that uh, the Christian church for hundreds of years, they would pray at least twice a day, set times. I'm not talking about when you're walking around and lifting up a prayer, you do that too. But set times, a minimum 30 minutes, maybe to a maximum of 90 minutes of uh, devotional time. And some did it twice a day, some did three or some did four times a day. Now we know from Tertullian, in the second century, by by his time, it had become universal throughout the Christian um, uh, church to pray five times a day. And Mm. that was sunrise, 9 a.m., noon, 3 p.m., and at uh, twilight. And it was the Muslims who picked that up. And people are familiar today that the Muslims pray five times a day, but they got that from the Christians. And I don't think it's needed that you have to pray five times a day, even though it's fantastic. But I do believe that the Lord would have us pray uh, under the vast majority of circumstances, morning and evening, and have it to be somewhere between 30 and 90 minutes each time. And and not just prayer and that devotion, but Bible reading and worship too. But to have that kind of robust spiritual life is what's needed. And it makes an incredible difference. If we want the Lord to do something extraordinary and special and pour out a spirit, then we need to seek him in such a way that he's pleased with us and responds, as the scriptures say, draw near to him, and he draws near to us. And that's what we're seeking to do. And I believe it's the desire of the Lord for all Christians. And it's not practiced much in the West, but in the international church, uh, not Europe so much, but the rest of the international church, uh, their prayer lives are fantastic, really incredible, and much more consistent with historical Christianity. So testimony here, you made a comment 
several years ago, something, a paradigm shift maybe, uh, took place. And I think you used the word even traumatic maybe. Uh, take us back and just give us uh, that testimony. I mean, just imagine this is the uh, first time you've shared what God said to you. Uh, well, I, by God's grace, when I was still with crew, I was in the 90s, we saw a revival there. And then I went to a seminary, came back, started Christian Union in 2002. And then in a similar way, the Lord uh, spoke to me, put on my heart. We radically increased prayer and fasting, as well as emphasis on repentance. Mm -hmm. And then saw the fruitfulness of that in terms of involvement, testimonies, miracles, all sorts of things. And uh, to the extent that we seek the Lord in those ways, we see amazing things happen. And so it was very dramatic when we started, I started Christian Union, but didn't have quite that emphasis yet. I knew it would be coming. But after, I don't know, three or four years or something like that, I sent from the Lord, it was time. And so we went from praying one hour a day, I mean, once a week to two hours a day. Now in those two hours of prayer, it wouldn't be always a hundred percent prayer. Sometimes it'd be a, some teaching on the nature of revival or working through obstacles and sometimes listening to the Lord, which is part of prayer. But uh, we saw a radical increase in fruitfulness. And in and, and those days we were just at Princeton and it's just started at Harvard. And uh, the ministry went from having a few decisions for Christ to every, uh, every year to then 10 decisions for Christ. Then the next year, 20 people became Christians. The next year, 30 people became Christians. And then ministry involvement uh, equaled almost 10% um, of the student body. And that was a wonderful season in time. What I found, though, is that over time, as people are staff, as they move on to other jobs, other responsibilities, become pastors, whatever else, then it's quite a responsibility then to develop the new person that comes in. And it takes a lot of work because the uh, so many American Christians, and especially if they're seminary educated, there can be a lot of misunderstandings about seeking God that hinder uh, the energetic seeking after him. And that has to be dealt with from the scriptures so that the heart is revived. Uh, would give, to give them an eagerness to seek the Lord, because without that, then the ministry, it kind of goes back to where it was. I mean, typical American sort of Western sort of impact. And I'm thankful for what the Lord's doing in the West. Uh, every, the Lord's not left us. Um, he's still with us. We still see people come to faith. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge the facts and that the church in the West has been declining steadily since the 1960s. And there's a reason for that. Uh, it's because we've left the Lord, not because he wants to leave us. Wow. So we have to re-educate our people or, uh, when they join with us, even if they have a seminary education in terms of what it means to seek the Lord as he requires and not simply what they're used to. So today, Christian Union, uh, you were on basically two campuses when you started all this. What does it look like today? So, yeah, we're still at nine schools. Both cases were at nine schools. So we're at Brown University, Columbia University, Harvard, Cornell, Dartmouth, Stanford, University of Pennsylvania. And you know why we're at these schools. It's because they're both very secular and academically intense and very influential. Uh, so many of the nation's uh, most influential leaders go to these schools. And some of them are known, uh, they're in the news, but then there are many, many thousands of others that ha have influential positions in our society that aren't known. And we think we want to make sure we've got a strong Christian witness and that we're saturating these people with the gospel. I think of uh, well-known people like uh, Trump and Musk, who won't, both went to the University of Pennsylvania. I think of Yale, that had Hillary, who went there. And these are governmental people, but it's the same in, in business. You think of Zuckerberg, who went to Harvard, Gates, who went to Harvard, uh, Bezos, who went to Princeton. I mean, it's on and on, whether it's business, education, media, you have a lot of very influential people. So uh, not that everyone's going to become a Christian while we're there, but by God's grace, uh, we can influence them. They can have friends that they know who are Christian. Everything we can do to see and present the Christian worldview so that uh, many will come to faith in Christ. Others will at least know a Christian friend and know it's not um, extreme or weird to be Christian, but it's a beautiful and wonderful thing. This is our mission for these universities. And I think Stanford was on your list for a while. It's there. Yeah, we have we have a ministry there. Okay, so then um, you had about eight or nine staff at that point. 
how, how many staff has God called to serve with you currently or before COVID, a couple of years ago? We have about half who are doing direct ministry, about 25 at the universities. But then we have our other half of our staff are people like myself who aren't directly working with the students and our fundraisers and our uh, assistants and, and also our ministry to the rest of the U.S. Because our ministry has two sides. It's the university side we call CU Universities and then CU America, which is ministry to people across the country. We Great. sponsor national fast through Facebook. We also have a uh, retreat in people's homes, a simulcast. Our next one's in October, and this is for adults. So we have those two sides of the ministry, both with a, a zeal to develop Christians as Christian leaders, the most important of which is to be very, very strong in the Lord. Great. We're going to come back to go deeper into that on our next podcast. Man, I can't tell you, my heart leaps every time I hear you share. Uh, and uh, for all of our podcast listeners and viewers, and man, it's just it's just what's been just embedded in my heart and erupts, Matt, is that every revival in the history of the world, no matter where it ignites, every revival has been given birth to, cradled, or nurtured in prayer. And you have given us a testimony of uh, laying the foundation, setting the sails for that to be true once again. So thank you, Matt. And thank you, One Cry Podcast. Please join us whenever you see Matt Bennett's name pop up next on a future podcast. You won't want to miss it. I've got an exciting questions to ask him. And uh, I want God to move through his testimony to ignite a fire freshly in all of our hearts to make prayer central, foundational, and really the dynamite of everything we do in our ministry. So thank you, Matt. Great talk. It's our pleasure. I think the prayer warriors I've been blessed to be around mm -hmm. at times, uh, there's this common trait, I feel like. They're not starting a conversation. They're picking one up. Yeah, just continuing it. it it's it, And it's the most n supernaturally natural thing to them. Mm -hmm. they, they like, oh, yeah, well, let's go to God. Yeah. Let's go to God. And that, Mm -hmm. Every aspect of life, you know, I, I remember early on in ministry, I continually found myself, which I still do, walking into moments that seminary didn't give me what I needed, mm -hmm. you know, like experience. I sure didn't have it, you mm -hmm. know, like that I needed the Lord. Yeah. And, 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 and I remember the Lord teaching me early. And now I do this with every lunch and I mm -hmm. strive to every counseling moment, even mm -hmm. every meeting I walk into is to engage God. Mm -hmm. Say, Lord, please, please come and and, mm -hmm. and you superintend this thing. Like mm -hmm. you watch over, you speak through, like and and, mm -hmm. and in the midst of it, pray. Yeah. Can you imagine can you imagine how welcomed God feels mm. in unceasing prayer? And how he answers those prayers. Yeah, right. How he responds to that because right. he has everything to gain by doing that. That's exactly uh, right. Because he'll be more greatly glorified. Yeah. And uh, so I think we need to pray. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to pray for this, that God would give us this ready awareness, mm -hmm. you know, that, that praise God for the prayer closet, mm -hmm. you know, pray, praise God for the right before we go to bed prayer time. Mm -hmm. uh, but don't leave prayer in those two places. Mm -hmm. You know, let prayer be a part of the whole day. So we want to encourage uh, our listeners now to pray with us. You know, like every week we don't want to talk about it and not do it. So let's ask the Lord to teach us to be a people of unceasing prayer. I'll start and kick it to you, Bill. Mm -hmm. So, Lord, uh, we welcome, uh, Lord, honestly, some training in this area of our prayer life that you'd help us to be people that truly pray all the time, that there would be this real conversation from our heart to you, uh, Lord, that we would pray over everything and about anything and continually, consistently, and that it would be so real. God, that our, our lives, our conversations with you would be so authentic that the world would see that, uh, Lord, that even other brothers and sisters would see that and say, I want that. I want to know God that way. I, I want to be able to have those kind of talks with him. So, Lord, I, I pray that you would ignite a, a passion for unceasing prayer and that it would play out. And, Father, we just ask you this. Lord, make us men and women of unceasing prayer. Right. Lord, I, I remember you prompting me to pray that 
beginning in college and for many, many years uh, praying that prayer. And uh, Father, uh, I'm not where I need to be, but Father, I thank you that I'm I'm uh, I'm closer than I was Amen. to that to that lifestyle, Amen. and and uh, help us to see, Lord, that this is just the Christian life. Mm-hmm. Prayer is not just a separate thing. It's it's what you do when you're in a abiding relationship. Uh, you talk to each other, and you talk about everything, and mm-hmm. you talk all day long. So take us there, Lord, and we'll give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks again for joining us, and uh, what a what an important topic, yeah. Kyle. And uh, we pray that you would become and all of us would become men and women of unceasing prayer. We'll see you next time.